We can start the last uh, session of today. Apologies for the small uh, delay. Leonardo must have parted uh, because of Italy's win, I suppose, last night. So, <laughs> yeah. so Leonardo Rastelli from Stony Brook uh, and the title, well, no. <laughs> View, 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 view. No, next, ne yes. Full screen, yes. Okay, and the title is. Okay, thank you very much. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, as always. Um, and so today I will um, a report on some work um, whose um, main part will uh, appear very soon, we hope. Uh, this is working process with Chris Beam, but uh, I will have to review the general framework. This is something I've been working on the last couple of years, and there are, this is my complete list of collaborators. So although uh, the title is rather lo long and somewhat technical, I will try to um, start with a rather uh, broad introduction and put this into context. So. Um, Perhaps I don't need to advertise to this audience the fact that uh, superconformal field theory is in four dimensions with two uh, supercharges, which means half maximal supersymmetry, are uh, central to many recent developments in, in physical mathematics. Uh, there is a very rich landscape of theories that, of, of, of which we know a lot, but we, we are still getting surprised by uh, new exotic animals that are found in the wild. Uh, and there's a very rich physics and a very rich mathematics. And of course, um, we don't quite know to, to, to mathematician satisfaction how to characterize uh, rigorously this category of n equal to two superconformal field theories. Uh, but the good news, and this is a, uh, is a theme uh, in, in, in many of the things that you're hearing this week, is that uh, although the full theory may, may yet escape uh, full axiomatization, many of its substructure, many of, it, of its moving parts are, perfect, are perfectly rigorous mathematical objects. And so the usual ploy of physical mathematics is you make a caricature of the physical problem, you identify a substructure that you can uh, characterize in a simple set of axioms, and then um, we have been uh, lucky that it's often the case that physical expectations lead to precise mathematical conjecture, which in some cases you can prove, in other cases you can hand to your mathematician friends. And so today I will describe precisely one such substructure. Um, uh, this discovery that we made a couple of years ago that to any n equal to two superconformal field theory, one can associate a vertex operator algebra, which is a perfectly axiomatized notion uh, uh, in, in, in mathematics. Um, and uh, we review uh, several elements of this correspondence. But the basic idea is that this vertex operator algebra can be understood as a certain closed subalgebra. It's closed under the operator product expansion of the four dimensional theory. And, um, and so, the, the, if, you will, if you wish, the bootstrap problem associated with this subalgebra decouples from the rest of the theory and can be studied in isolation. And it's often the case that this closed subset is solvable. So this vertex operator algebra is a very powerful invariant. It's a very rich invariant of the four-dimensional theory, but its uh, connection with more conventional protected quantities is, is still yet uh, to be un completely understood. And today I will uh, try to provide you with an additional item in this dictionary. In particular, I will, I will motivate and, and, and explore a conjecture for how the Higgs branch of the four-dimensional theory is encoded in this vertex operator algebra. Uh, and uh, although the conjecture is simple, it actually leads to very surprising predictions. For example, the, the, in the title, I have this, this phrase, modular differential equation. We will show that this conjecture leads, rather surprisingly, to very intricate uh, modular behavior of the superconformal index of the four-dimensional theory, where you, a priori, you had no real expectation to see modular invariance in four dimensions. So this is my outline. I will start with a 
truly lightning review of n equal to two super conformal field theories. And then uh, again, as part of my uh, slow introduction, I will um, characterize uh, two important geometric invariants of the theory, which are Higgs and Coulomb branches of vacua. Uh, and I will do it from uh, a sort of a, a elementary algebraic geometric viewpoint in terms of the ring of functions, which you can associate with the chiral rings. Then I will describe this correspondence with the vertex operator algebra, and then I will come to the, to the main part of the talk where I will explain this conjecture about the Higgs branch. So uh, what are n equal to two superconformal field theories? Well, vanilla traditional uh, theories that have a conventional Lagrangian description can be simply described. You specify the gauge group, which is just a product of simple factors. These are finite dimensional compact Lie groups. No U1 factors are allowed because you have Landau poles. We are requiring that the theory be well defined in the UV. And then uh, there's the matter, which is uh, a bunch of uh, half hypermultiplets in some pseudo real representation of rho of the, of the gauge group. In fact, if we insist, as I'm going to do now, that the theory is not just well defined in the UV, but in fact conformal, uh, you have to impose uh, that for each simple factor, the one loop beta function is zero, and then this guarantees that the theory is actually conformal invariance uh, to all orders. And so, in fact, uh, given this data, the Lagrange of the theory is uniquely fixed by symmetry. The hypermultiplets in the representation row and vector multiplets, including the gauge field and its superpartners in the adjoint of the group. And this, in fact, is a simple combinatorial problem that has been completely solved. Just enumerate all possible Lagrangians with this structure. Now, the, the theory, the only parameters in the conformal case are the complexified gauge coupling tau, one for each simple factor of the, of the gauge group. And they are exactly marginal deformation of the superconformal field theory. They parameterize what is conventionally known as the conformal manifold, which I'm going to call U for the superconformal field theory. In fact, Non-perturbative dualities uh, in, induce discrete identifications in this space of couplings, uh, but this will not be important today. In fact, we have learned that the space of n equal to two superconformal theory is much, much bigger. And one way to understand this is that uh, there is by now a, a great variety of exotic matter, which we can uh, define as some isolated superconformal field theory. There's no exactly marginal coupling uh, that has no conventional Lagrangian description, and then uh, you can use this novel matter just as you did use the hypermultiplets. You, you couple it to gauge fields by gauging a subgroup of their global symmetry, making sure that the beta function vanishes. And this lead, leads to large continuous family of superconformal field theories. And in fact, in all known examples, this is always how these continuous parameters arise. They, they come from weak gauging uh, of some isolated superconformal field theories, and one may conjecture that this is a general fact. Now, I need some notation to, to move forward. Uh, so, uh, the superalgebra is SU2, 2 slash uh, 2. What will be important, really, is that you try to memorize for the next uh, few minutes that I'm going to use capital R to denote the non abelian factor of the art symmetry, the SU2 a little r to denote the abelian factor. That's really the main point of this notational slide. Um, so the, the bosonic subalgebra is the problem of the conformal factor times the art symmetry, which is u2 that I'm going to write as su2 sub big r times u1 little r. And the supercharges, um, I don't think this pointer is really working, but never mind. The supercharges are doublets of the su2. And so again, another thing that you may want to memorize that I'm using this index calligraphic i uh, as a doublet index of SU2. There are conformal supercharges S's, which are conjugate to the Poincaré supercharges, the usual story of superconformal invariance. Another bit of notation, I'm going to use the symbol phi to denote the complex scalar in the n equal to 2 vector multiplet. It, has, it is an SU2 R singlet, but it carries charge on the U and R. And uh, Q with this index I are a doublet of this complex scalar, which are part of the hypermalt and their singlets on the UNR. Okay, with these notations in place, so what is the uh, definition of these uh, branches of vacuum? Well, the Higgs branch, MH, is uh, the branch of vacuum where, of supersymmetric where the 
non abelian factor of the at symmetry is broken, but the abelian one is preserved. And in a Lagrangian theory, you characterize by giving expectation values to the complex scalar in the hypermultiplet by keeping the expectation value of the complex scalar in the vector multiplet zero. That's very interesting geometry. It's hyperkähler, and in particular, if, if you don't particularly care about the metric and are just interested in, 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 in algebraic geometry, then it's, it's, a simple, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a variety with an additional holomorphic symplectic structure. In fact, it is an invariant of the conformal manifold. The Higgs bench does not change according to where you are in the conformal manifold. And since today's talk will be mostly concerned about the Higgs branch, in fact, uh, you know, you, you really, we're really about talking, talking about something which does not depend on couplings, does not depend on the exact marginal parameters of the theory. On the other hand, for completeness, I'm also going to tell you briefly about the Coulomb branch. It's the other way around. So here, phi is non-zero. And there's very interesting geometry, again, it's special carriage geometry. And it, this is the uh, venerable subject of cyber witten theory where there is, in fact, a very interesting non-trivial dependence on, the, on the, where you are on the, on the conformal manifold. Now, a more in, intrinsic characterization of the branches, as you're familiar with, is in terms of gauge invariant uh, local chiral operators. And so, in fact, we can define uh, two uh, subalgebras of the full operator algebra, which are the Higgs and Coulomb chiral ring. So the chiral ring of Higgs type is defined as this uh, simultaneous cohomology of two supercharges, Q and Q tilde. You see the, the full uh, Lorentz spinner indices are, uh, are there. And then up one and uh, down two are SU2R indices. And so these are supercharges of opposite chirality from the point of view of the Lorentz symmetry. And the operators uh, that are in the ring um, have conformal dimension equal to twice the uh, SU2R cartan and their E1R singlet. Conversely, the Coulomb ring is two supercharges of the same chirality, and the delta is equal to the absolute value of little r with big R equal to zero. So as, um, as rings, uh, they, um, you know, as, as from one to one algebra geometry, they in fact are uh, both commutative C algebra, they're both reduced, there are non potent elements. But they're rather different. The Coulomb chiral ring in all non examples is freely generated, so it's actually trivial. Whereas the uh, Higgs uh, chiral ring has typically an interesting relation that defines some interesting affine variety. And so this is in, in, in formulas what I just said. We identify the uh, Higgs and Coulomb chiral ring with the coordinate rings of these varieties. Now, this relation is actually easy to prove in Lagrangian examples, but there's not yet a complete theory, or in fact any theory as far as I'm concerned, from an abstract viewpoint of what it means to spontaneously break conformal invariance for a superconformal field theory. So in the general case, I'm, take, I'm, I'm going to take this as part of the law, or if you want, as a conjectural relation. Part of this law is that for the Higgs branch, for example, will always be uh, in a, a variety, or at least, or in, in fact, in all cases, I know it's always an affine variety. And, uh, and correspondingly, there will be a reduced ring of functions uh, that characterizes it in an equivalent fashion. OK, so you can view these algebraic structures, of course, as you can embed them in the general, complicated, yet uh, not tractable, operator product algebra of the, of the four-dimensional theory. In general, we know we have a conformal field theory. We have a convergent operator product expansion, which is a true operator equation. Uh, and in principle, this would give us a complete definition of the theory, including non-protective quantities. But at the, at the moment, this is really beyond uh, mathematical formalization. And so today, I will try to do something a little bit intermediate between the, the chiral ring that I just defined, which are very simple, and the full-fledged operator algebra. We'll find something in the middle, which is, in fact, the vertex operator algebra that I've advertised so far. And it turns out that uh, this vertex operator algebra, although it's not at all a priori obvious from now, will be a vast generalization of the Higgs chiral ring. It will contain the information about the Higgs branch and a lot more. And I should also advertise our work on somewhat different flavor on using uh, the numerical bootstrap for the non-prothetic quantities in the full operator algebra. 
OK, so that concludes my broad introduction. And now I'm going to um, describe to you this vertex operator algebra. Uh, again, it's a cohomological construction. We are going to carve out out of the, of the full theory a subalgebra by passing to the cohomology of a certain nilpotent supercharge. And the novel part of the story here is that it's a linear combination of a Poincare and a conformal supercharge. Uh, and it is such that operators in cohomology um, necessarily must live on a fixed plane of the four dimensional space. Otherwise, they cannot be uh, uh, in cohomology. And in fact, correlation functions of operators uh, that are Q close in the plane, although a priori they would depend on Z and Z bar, which are the coordinates of the planes, are in fact meromorphic functions. And the formal argument is the usual one. You prove that the dependence on the z-bar coordinate is q exact. So that in cohomology, you just get vertex meromorphic vertex operators. You already see that this is a, a very interesting generalization of the usual chiral ring story, because uh, in the chiral ring, the cohomology class is, in, in cohomology class is independent of the whole position of our four-dimensional spacetime, whereas here we retain a, a, a meromorphic uh, dependence on z, which is tractable, but of course much richer. So at the origin in the plane, the, uh, this operator can be characterized very easily. They are, in fact, uh, a generalization of the Higgs branch operators. You will perhaps recall that for Higgs branch operator, delta is equal to 2R. And here we're also lying operators that carry derivatives. So J1 plus J2 are Lorentz quantum numbers. And that's, of course, expected because I have Z dependence. So holomorphic derivative with respect to Z leave me in, in this protected subsector, and so they must be accounted for in this uh, chirality condition. In fact, operators of this kind had appeared before. They characterize a certain limit of the superconformal index, which we call the Schur limit, because you find that this interesting structure of, of Schur polynomials, under which you can write large classes of such indices. And now away from the origin, uh, in order to remain in Q cohomology, you are in fact instructed to twist the anti-holomorphic SL2 bar dependence by uh, taking the diagonal combination of SL2 bar and the complexified SU2R. And what that means in practice, you are correlating the dependence on Z bar with the internal dependence on, in our symmetry space. And that works nicely in such a way that correlation function of this type of operators are in fact meromorphic. And so this structure defines a vertex operator algebra. I, I, was tempted to write the axiom of vertex operator algebra here, but they are so obscure that you certainly wouldn't learn anything from them. And so uh, the, the informal notion that physicists have is perfectly fine, but, of, but actually here everything can be, can be made uh, rigorous to the satisfaction of a mathematician. So this is what mathematicians call a vertex operator algebra. Um, so this is a, perhaps slightly more technical here. I've enumerated the shortened uh, multiplets <laughs> of the uh, superconformal algebra that give contribution uh, to this vertex operator algebra. I want to emphasize for you this behat type operator. Those are the ones that give, um, unfortunately, this doesn't seem to work. Uh, perhaps I don't see it. They give rise to, uh, they correspond to the Higgs branch operators. But then you see there are many more operators. There are more general chiral operators, these D and D bar types, and then operate, uh, some shortening condition you really probably have never heard before. There are some, some exotic semi-shortening conditions. The only one that, uh, that may, um, thank you, uh, that uh, may be familiar to you is the stress tensor multiplet. And also I want to emphasize what is not in this list. Coulomb type operator, such as trace phi to the k for Lagrangian theories are not in this list. So there is clearly a sense in which uh, we are capturing something related to the Higgs branch, but with a lot more stuff. OK, of course, you can go through the exercise of characterizing the vertex operator algebra for free theories. And you learn that a free hypermultiple gives you a pair of symplectic bosons of dimension 1 half each with this kind of uh, operator product expansion. Notice that the central charge is negative, is minus 1. Like, similarly, the vector multiple will give you a Bisigo system of weights 1, 0, and again, the central charge is negative, minus 2. So these are non-unitary uh, vertex operator algebra. And not, also notice that spin statistics is violated. So these are half 
integer modded, but they're bosons, and these are integer modded, but they're fermions. So in fact, there is a very elegant prescription to uh, realize at the level of this vertex operator algebra the gauging uh, story that I had at the beginning, where you have a priori some black box theory with some uh, flavored symmetry GF, and you want to gauge a subgroup G, making sure that the beta function is zero. Suppose you know the chiral algebra of the original theory. Can you find the chiral algebra of the theory after gauging? So I, I just told you that the vector multiple co co correspond to a BC Gauss system, which must be in the adjoint of the gauge group. Of course, we must impose a Gauss law with respect to gauge singlets, but that would not be enough. This would just be description, the description of the theory at zero gauge coupling. As soon as you turn on the gauge coupling, in fact, some of the short multiples will recombine into long, which means some of the operators will leave uh, this protected sector. And in fact, the actual vertex operator algebra will, will be smaller. And in fact, there is an elegant BRST prescription that allows you to characterize exactly which operators remain protected. It's in terms of something which you may have seen in the context of gauge WZW model. You, you, any theory, uh, the theory you start with has a, has a certain uh, flavored symmetry, so there's an associated uh, flavor core NJ, and you can build just in terms of this universal data, this very stupid operator, which is nilpotent precisely when the beta function is zero. So this, this is a way to characterize large classes of vertex operator algebra. Some structural properties of the story are as follows. First of all, I already remarked that we can have both boson and fermions. So uh, actually we have a super, a vertex super algebra. Uh, a property which is not uh, clear at, uh, to the naked eye, but it, it, it's, a nice, it's a nice bonus. In fact, it's a, this is a, uh, in fact a conformal vertex algebra. So, you are guaranteed to have SL2 invariants because you're of the symmetry respect the plane under which this, uh, over, over where these uh, vertex operators are inserted. But in fact, there's always a conformal vector. There's a, always a stress energy tensor, which descends uh, from, from a certain uh, four dimensional operator, which is in the same multiple as the four dimensional stress tensor. It's the SU2R nether current. And from this correspondence, you learn, in fact, that the two-dimensional central charge is proportional to the four-dimensional C anomaly coefficient. C is not A. Remember, A is the one that decreases under RG flow. Yes, there is a. OK, Z is just the, the complex coordinate on a plane. It's really as simple as that. I have uh, R4, which is Euclidean space. I, uh, select a plane. Which particular plane is selected depends on the particular indices I chose for my uh, nilpotent supercharge, but of course any choice would be equivalent to any other. And then I parameterize uh, the coordinates on the plane by usual uh, z and z bar. And it turns out that the z bar dependent drops out for this particular class of operators. So you see this minus sign is indeed an indication that the two dimensional theory is always non unitary. Um, well, I also mentioned that we can have either Z graded or Z mod two graded. So we have Q to the one half, to the three half, et cetera, for example, for, the, for this uh, symplectic boson, uh, but no space statistics. And the, uh, these graded spaces are always, space are always finite dimensional. Note, by the way, that if you read the mathematical uh, literature, uh, in the mathematical literature, they have a different convention for uh, modding. I'm sticking to the good old physics convention where uh, you shift the modding by uh, minus h, h being the conformal weight of the, uh, of the field. OK, so in some other structural properties is the fact that much like the S global SL2 symmetry enhances to Virasoro, if you have some global flavored symmetry in four dimensions, uh, there will be an associated nether current. And by supersymmetry, there will be an associated so-called moment map operator, which is one of these behat type operators, one of the operators that is part of the Higgs branch chiral ring. And uh, this will give rise to an element in cohomology that uh, uh, corresponds, in fact, to just an affine current algebra, an affine current subalgebra of the full vertex operator algebra, whose, with negative level proportional to the four-dimensional level. 
Um, and finally, I come to, for the, well, for the purpose of this talk is, is perhaps the most relevant structural properties, the fact that uh, I described earlier to you the Higgs chiral ring, uh, whose uh, max pack, if you will, is the uh, Higgs variety. And of course, the ring will, we in, in all physical example, will be finally generated, and we can, we can, we, we can actually prove uh, in, in simple way, a simple way that each generator of the Higgs chiral ring will give rise to a generator of the vertex operator algebra. Vertex operator algebra um, can be characterized in, 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 uh, in some simple cases in terms of a finite set of generators. What is a generator is something that cannot be obtained as non-singular term in the operator process function of other elements. For example, the Virasoro algebra is a single generator T, an affine algebra has a single generator J, the W3 algebra has two generators, which are T and W, and everything else is normal order product of derivatives of these operators. So it turns out that the generators of the, of the Higgs chiral ring give generators of the chiral algebra. And this is a rather striking fact that we'll illustrate later in examples. The relations that you generically have in the Higgs uh, chiral ring are encoded algebraically uh, in the fact that this chiral algebra will have appropriate null states. The vertex superior algebra will have null states that take into account the null relations. And it's crucial here that you have intricate representation theory at negative level. However, and this is the part that confused us for a very long time, uh, genetically you have additional generators um, totally unrelated to the Higgs branch. So, I already mentioned uh, the, the stress tensor, except in, in sporadic cases where the stress tensor can, is given by the Sugavara uh, construction, I told you that very generically, the four-dimensional stress tensor gives rise to a two-dimensional stress tensor, and if the Sugavara uh, relation between C and K is not obeyed, that is an additional generator. But of course, that has nothing to do with the Higgs branch. It's something that descends from, uh, from the four-dimensional uh, uh, stress tensor, or better from the four-dimensional SU2 R current. Sometimes you also find additional generators. Some of them are easy to understand. There are additional uh, n equal one chiral rings that you may associate to mixed branches. But in some other cases, there are completely exotic multiplets for which we have no geometric intuition whatsoever. And so the question that leads me, leads me uh, to the, the, the heart of my talk is, can we actually reconstruct, can we actually uh, find inside this complicated invariant, this vertex operator algebra, the Higgs branch. Or alternatively, since the Higgs branch MH is completely characterized by the, chi the chiral ring RH, can we distill this chiral ring from the vertex operator algebra? That is the question that I will try to answer in the last part of my talk. OK, so, uh, so here is our conjecture. There is, in fact, a natural commutative algebra you can associate to any uh, vertex operator algebra. This is the so-called C2 uh, algebra, sometimes called Joux C2 algebra or Joux commutative algebra. Uh, and I will denote it uh, as R sub V, uh, following some of the mathematical literature. And how is this algebra defined? Well, first of all, let me define the so-called C2 space, somewhat non-transparent definition, but basically what the C2 space is, is the subspace uh, of, 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 of the state space. Uh, you know, you build the genetic state uh, of, of, of the uh, vertex operator algebra, as I said, by taking normal order products of derivatives. And if inside any of those normal order products there is an actual derivative, uh, then you declare this to be part of the C2 space. And modding out by the C2 space, you find this uh, space R sub V. So in other terms, this is the space where I modded out by the ideal generated by operators that contain derivatives. Example, Virasoro algebra, L minus, uh, the stress tensor acting on the vacuum gives me L minus 2, uh, according to the usual state operator map. L minus 3 is derivative of the stress tensor, so I want to forget it, and so all the higher L minus N with N greater than two. And so in the case of the Virasoro algebra, this RV space is generated uh, for generic central charges, freely generated by L minus two. 
And clearly there is a natural commutative structure that just descends on this space. In fact, it looks like we are on the right track because there is also a natural Poisson structure on this space, which is uh, defined by the operator part expansion. But the crucial clue is that generically, this ring is not reduced. There are nilpotent elements. And so really the minimal conjecture, which is extraordinarily simple, but also, as you, we will see, leads to very uh, dramatic uh, predictions, is that the Higgs branch color ring is just the reduced part of the RV ring. You go to this procedure, modeled by the near radical, and this is the recipe that we are claiming gives the Higgs branch chiral ring. Okay, so it may take a little to absorb. I will give example in a minute. In fact, this notion had appeared earlier in the mathematical literature. Arakawa defined the associative variety of a vertex operator algebra as well, the ring of that variety is, is what I'm calling RH, or in other terms, the variety is max spec of RH. And it's, it's a highly non-trivial conjecture. It's still a little bit mysterious why it works in all examples, but it does. Okay, so I will give examples in a minute, but let me now explore some of the consequences of this conjecture. A first consequence, I told you that the stress tensor is not something that comes from the four-dimensional Higgs branch. So it must be that I get rid of it by this procedure. And the only way I can get rid of it is, in fact, uh, this object is, in fact, nilpotent uh, in the C2 space. So it must be that there is some uh, finite power integer r, r such that L minus 2 to the r acting on the vacuum is uh, part of the C2 space. It's something I can write in terms of uh, norm, uh, normal order product of operators containing at least one derivative. Or in other terms, it means that if, if I consider the Verma module before modding out by nulls, I in fact must identify a null state of this form, where omega is the vacuum state and V is an element of C2. Now the zero mode of a null must vanish when inserting correlation functions, so in particular it must vanish when inserting on the torus. And so the supertrace, or the character with minus one to the f of the theory, uh, must be zero if I insert the zero mode. And this is a somewhat complicated story that I don't have time to review, but under additional technical assumptions that we cannot prove in general, uh, that are obeyed, but they're in fact obeyed in all examples that we have checked, uh, such a relation gives rise to a monic, holomorphic, in generally twisted, modular differential equation for the vacuum character of the chiral algebra. Now, by the correspondence with the four-dimensional uh, physics, the vacuum character of this vertex operator algebra is, in fact, the sure limit of the superconformal index that I mentioned earlier. So this makes the somewhat striking prediction that the sure index of any n equal to two superconformal field theory, if this conjecture is true, must obey a modular covariant holomorphic differential equation. Now, I, I, I will be, um, let me briefly review the structure of the equation. So we have, uh, we're distinguishing two cases, really. There's an intuitive case where we have integer grading for the, uh, for the uh, operators in the uh, vertex operator algebra. That must be covariant under the full modular group. And the, the, we also have a twisted case in the case of half integer grading, uh, which is covariant under this particular congruent subgroup, gamma zero two. And so the differential op operator annihilates this vacuum character as uh, schematically the following form. There are these, uh, perhaps I can start from here. First one defines these ser modular covariant derivatives that map uh, modular form of weight k to modular form weight k plus two. This E2 is, as is well known, the Eisen here, which is not completely covariant, and that compensates for the non-covariance of this element. And then uh, you uh, nest them in this way to define this script D over k, and then the differential operator annihilates the character 
is something where you compensate for the weight k, the total weight k, by multiplying by the appropriate, appropriate uh, by a modular form of the appropriate weight. So you see the weight k minus r adds with r to give me total weight k, so that this is homogeneous in weight. And fr of k um, is a modular form of weight to r for the appropriate uh, modular group, either the full modular group or the particular congruence group we are interested in. Of course, these are well-known rings. They're finitely generated. You can, you know, ex at any given order, you can write down an ansatz, which is a finite dimensional ansatz with a finite number of coefficients for what this operator can be. And so you can understand how we did it. We had this guess that this type of differential operator must annihilate the index. You check, you fix the, the coefficients by, by feeding the Q expansion for the first few terms, and then you check that, that the whole thing is, in fact, annihilated. And so a corollary of this, which is surprising from a fundamental viewpoint, is that the sure index should transform as an element of a vector value modular form. So in other terms, the sure index transforms as a finite, in a finite dimensional representation of either the full modular group in the untwisted case of this gamma zero two in the twisted case. Uh, and that is something a priori I would not have expected. In fact, this means that, that using the fact that I have a finite dimensional representation of SL to Z, I can control the high temperature behavior of the index, the Q going to one limit of the index by making a modular transformation. And so if this was a unitary uh, vertex operator algebra, the Q going to one limit would be, of course, controlled by the vacuum uh, character. But given that this is non-unitary, the Q going to one limit will, in fact, be controlled by the lowest dimension, which is, in general, negative uh, of this finite dimensional representation of, uh, uh, under which the vacuum character transforms. And then we can use another idea so, so, so let me summarize what I just said. So for Q, as Q goes to one or beta going to zero, uh, the log of the character uh, mu must behave this way because of modular invariant, where this effective central charge is the standard central charge minus 24, this minimum dimension of the finite dimension, finite dimension representation, which is generally negative. In a separate development, Dipiat and Komardowski argued, in fact, that this high temperature behavior of, of the index is controlled by the four dimensional anomaly coefficients. And so putting this together, we actually get a prediction. We get a way to relate this H min to the C and A anomaly, which is surprising because whereas the C central charge is something that directly controls a, a, a behavior of uh, some, some operator of the chiral algebra, the vector operator algebra, because C controls the central charge, the vertex operator algebra. A has nothing to do with the vertex operator algebra, but somehow we know it, we know about it by looking at the high temperature behavior of the, of the vacuum character. So the, both central charges are in fact encoding the vertex operator algebra, which is something a priori you would not have expected. And so, so now this turns into experimental mathematics. You, we have this very large class of anical to superconformal field theories, many of, of, of about which we know indices uh, for many of them. And we just systematically check that in all cases, we find a finite order modular differential equation with the right modular properties. And in fact, by looking at this high temperature uh, behavior the way I just described, we compute the A anomaly, and in cases where we know it already, it matches known results, and everything is consistent. So let me describe now a few examples. Uh, the, the, perhaps the neatest uh, example is um, a class of uh, four-dimensional superconformal field theory uh, that I'm going to denote uh, as the Delin exceptional theory. Sorry, there is an owl missing here. So there are many ways to understand uh, how these theories are, 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 are uh, characterized. So there are many equivalent characterization of them. Let me give you one of them. So it turns out that embedding this uh, structure, this vertex operator algebra, into the full-fledged uh, operator algebra, the four-dimensional theory, gives you um, sufficient analytic power 
that you can derive new unitarity bounds for central charges. So suppose you have some uh, global symmetry uh, characterized by some uh, Lie algebra uh, G, or G sub F for flavor, uh, where um, HV is the dual constant number of G and dimension of G is the dimension of the representation. Then you can prove uh, by looking at uh, various OP coefficients in, uh, in, a, in an OP expansion or a four-dimensional moment map operator, that uh, these two inequalities must be obeyed. Uh, if, uh, you know, these inequalities relate the four-dimensional anomaly coefficient, various group theoretic data, and the level K of, uh, of the symmetry. And now you ask, um, well, for which algebras, if, if any, uh, can I saturate this equality? And in fact, can I saturate both of them? And it turns out, rather surprisingly, that yes, you can. For this very specific list uh, of Lie algebras, and moreover, uh, simultaneous saturation also turns out to completely fix the values of the central charges and of the level. Now, in the case of SU2, SU3, SO8, E6, E7, E8, these are uh, theories that we knew b about before. These are the rank one superconformal field theories, which are physically realized by putting a single D3 brain on F theory singularity. And it, from this picture, actually, you understand immediately that Higgs branches are one instant to moduli spaces for the appropriate algebra. So you have a D3 brain inside the seven brain uh, that looks like an instanton, and that's an old story. The surprising part is that we also find uh, G2 and F4. We didn't look, we didn't ask for them, but they come out. And in fact, this particular list of Lie algebras has a, has a long history. It's called the Delinea exceptional series, and it has remarkable group theoretic properties. For example, um, there are uniform formulas for, for dimensions of, of representations in terms of the dual constant number, uh, and also, um, in fact, uh, these are the only Lie algebras uh, such that, is, I'm going to say it in a somewhat convoluted way, if you take the symmetrized product of two adjoint representations, you find only three uh, algebras on the right-hand side. Generically, you find four. But for this particular choice, you find only three. And that's indeed related uh, to, the, to uh, our story because What's actually happening here is that when these bounds are saturated, additional null states appear in the vertex operator algebra. And these null states give you relations among the generator that, whose four-dimensional interpretation is that the relation uh, that define the uh, one instant on uh, moduli space. So the one instant moduli space can be uh, uniformly characterized uh, in terms of this uh, minimal impotent orbit. So you have some, uh, as I just said, you have the symmetrized product of two adjoint representations, and you're setting the right-hand side to zero. Uh, generically, you cannot win this game for all the representation on the right-hand side. For this particular list of theories, you can, and you find precisely the one instant to moduli space. And so these, the characters of this chiral algebra, so, so, okay, so from the four-dimensional viewpoint, I of Q is the sure index. From the two-dimensional viewpoint, this is the vacuum character of some affine Lie algebra. I don't know if you can read this. This is the name of the Lie algebra, of the affine Lie algebra. HV is just the, uh, the uh, dual coxeter number. And K is the level. So if I take, for example, A1 is the SU2 a finely algebra at level minus 4 thirds, uh, its vacuum character obeys a second order modular differential equation of this kind. And in fact, there's this uniform uh, modular differential equation that covers all these cases if you plug in the appropriate dual constant number. H4 is the usual Einstein series. And so using the theory that I told you about earlier, uh, well, the central charge is, of course, fixed. Uh, we can calculate H min. So there is, a, there is a second solution of the modular differential equation in second order. Um, and using then the modular properties, we can calculate the A central charge. Uh, this last column is somewhat more conjectural. 
if we assume uh, the Chapelle Tachikawa relation between the, uh, or some rule between the A and C anomalies and the uh, generator of the Coulomb branch, we find these numbers. Of course, these are the well known numbers for the known theories. For G2 and F4, nobody has ever spotted these theories yet in the wild. And so these are highly conjectural. In fact, they are forbidden by Kodai classification of singularity. So it's a little bit unclear what these numbers actually mean, but it's, it's an interesting curiosity that they come in one package with the other cases. Um, then uh, I can go to this list. I could, I could take uh, another half hour, but I won't. Um, so the list of course, I mean, you, I hope you, you got the message. We have checked a ton of examples. It always works often in surprising ways. A particularly simple and illuminated class of examples are uh, Argyris Douglas theory with trivial Higgs branch. Now, the associated chiral algebra or vertex operator algebra is conjecture for this case to be a minimal, a Virasoro algebra at the value of the central charge, which is uh, one of the minimal uh, Virasoro models. And in fact, as is well known, uh, the Virasoro algebra has a null state on the, uh, on the vacuum at this level. And so RV, which as a single generator, I told you it's L minus two, actually needs to be modded out by, uh, by the null. And so by the time you're done with that, you find, uh, you find something uh, whose uh, reduced ring is trivial, and so the associative variety is just a point that, of course, squares with the fact that there is no Higgs branch to begin with. But this, you see, this is highly non-trivial. We were puzzled for a very long time. How come these theories have a very non-trivial chiral algebra even if the Higgs branch is trivial? Well, the, the answer is, if you go through this, this whole recipe, you find that the associative variety is in fact trivial, so there is no Higgs branch. And then even less trivial examples are theory that have uh, as a C2 mod C2 Higgs branch, that's a minimal perturbative for SU2. Those arise from SU2 at some fractional level you get, you get client singularities. There are certain generalized bershatsky polyakov algebras. Again, it's a very intricate representation theories of this algebra has not really been fully worked out. We do this a little bit experimentally, but it all works for this conjecture to be true. We even worked out some uh, rather complicated case where we have these uh, Gaiotto's uh, SU2 quivers where you have uh, tri-fundamental uh, half hyperts uh, joined by SU2 gauge groups. So this is the quiver of genus G with S punctures. We don't really understand this pattern very well. So you see that the order is of the differential operator is somewhat erratic. One point that I want to emphasize is that it's often the case that this uh, finite dimensional uh, representation contains logarithmic solutions, okay? When the initial roots are um, are a negative integer, that's always the case. Uh, and so this actually provides a challenge for any slick physical interpretation you may have for these additional solutions. You have to test that interpretation against the fact that typically you will have logarithmic solutions. So this is the uh, result for n equal four to a mil. To see here you have twisted operators where uh, gamma zero of two uh, plays a role. And so um, I think I should, uh, I should um, head towards my conclusion. Clearly, the story I told you, well, it had somewhat two parts. It was a general, uh, general introduction. But then when it, things got concrete, it was a lot of experimental mathematics. Um, still, obviously, uh, it, it's clearly there is, a, there is a deep structure, but we don't fully understand it, or we don't really understand it. Uh, as I mentioned, um, the physical interpretation of the other elements of this vector value modular form is obscure. Anybody uh, that hears this story will be say, oh, of course, these are BPS defects. Uh, but in fact, um, uh, it's impossible to preserve the particular supercharge that we use to define this vertex operator algebra uh, for any such defects of the kind that we may want, such, li such line defects. There is this truly uh, mind-boggling connection uh, that is, again, largely experimental and uh, poorly understood 
between the object I talked about today, which is the Schur index, alternatively this vacuum character of the uh, vertex operator algebra, and a certain wall crossing invariant, which is computed in a completely different way. You go move to the Coulomb, on the Coulomb branch and you compute some trace of some um, order product of quantum conservative carbon uh, factors. Um, there is a beautiful work in these papers. There was, in fact, a paper today. Uh, but again, um, in, in that context, it may be, uh, it may be uh, very natural to interpret the additional solution as, as line defects, but uh, it, it doesn't seem to be the case in, in this uh, vertex operator algebra language. Um, I modded it out by the nulls because I didn't really want them, but perhaps why not? We, we like nulls. Perhaps we should, we should uh, free uh, our, our limited uh, physical, physics uh, uh, you know, uh, imagination and um, where well, perhaps there is a Higgs scheme lurking there with some interesting algebraic geometry which enriches the Higgs variety. Uh, there are other multiples that should be incorporated in geometric framework that I barely understand, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So my final message is, um, so you see, I told you a, a story where uh, the starting point, uh, all of this was actually motivated by the conformal bootstrap approach to uh, superconformal field theory. So we started, really, that's how this whole story started. We started trying to understand the full-fledged uh, local operator algebra, and then uh, we did some of this numerically, and then we said, well, but perhaps there is an analytic structure, and we found that there was a tiny subsector of the full-fledged uh, operator algebra that had this beautiful structure. And so clearly this is just the tip of the iceberg. We can only look forward to the new mathematics that will allow us to understand the full operator algebra. Thank you. Yes? We have five minutes. You said the Schur index is a part of a vector-valued modular form? Yes. What's, what's the index indexing the vector? It's the different solutions of this... Of, this, uh, of the modular differential equation? Of the modular equation, equation yes. Okay, I'll, for example, you said the vacuum character, some F on Lee algebra. In general, the vacuum character transforms into lots of other characters under a modular transformation. That, is that, that's exactly right. So the, the simplest example it was this one here. So this is a second-order e equation. Yeah. And these are, actually, in this case, these are just the characters of, a, of, an, of an affine Lie algebra at some, at some funny negative level. Okay, so it's, it's a modular form for a congruent subgroup of, uh, right, and so... The well, depending be, on whether it's a twisted case or the untwisted case, it's either... Let's the untwisted the case where it's simple. So then it would be a modular form for a, a congruent subgroup, and the vector would be the... Uh, just this two-dimensional representation of, of, uh, of uh, under which these two characters transform. And what's the weight? The weight is zero. So have you thought about uh, trying to look at a Rademacher expansion of this to, you know, it is a, it is a path integral on S3 times S1, isn't it? It is. It is a path so integral on S3 times S1. So you might try to look one. for a fairy tale type um, um, story? I haven't really thought about it, no. But, uh, but we can... Um, um, we have some, uh, we have this story that I told you a little bit earlier about the Q going to one limit, so we know that asymptotics. Well, um, it's not about asymptotics, we'll be trying to interpret it in terms of a five-dimensional path interval. We have not. It was Bernard and then... Uh, to the best of my knowledge, this list you mentioned of E8, E7, and so on, was first discovered by Predrag Zitanovic. So when I use that in talks, I mention that as a list of uh, Tsitanovich, Delin, and Gross. There's another paper by Del Benedict Gross from Harvard and Delin, where they have a full triangle, which also was discovered by Tsitanovich. And uh, this, you. so there's an extension. First question is, do you see the other lines of the triangle? And second question, you can also extend that by adding super algebras. Right. So. Um no, we, don't, we only see this list. Uh, we saw, to be honest, we see a little bit more, which is, uh, we, we, we see a, a couple more, sorry, okay, it depends on what your, uh, your assumptions are. If you restrict to Lie algebras, that's all we see. 
if you uh, allow a little bit more flexibility, we also find something which is called E7 plus a half that was already in the literature, and it's some funny non, uh, non semi simple Lie algebra that is also arises naturally as a solution of this modular differential equation, but the physical interpretation is unclear. Uh, and then uh, you can play a different game, which is ask yourself, uh, can you just classify all possible solution of, uh, uh, of, this, of a modular differential equation of second order with arbitrary coefficients? And such that, of course, they have an in, a, a expansion with integer uh, coefficients. And then we find this list and a couple more examples uh, that we do not know how to interpret. So it, we are, in fact, recycling some of the work that was done long ago in the context of classifying rational conformal field theories. But of course, most of the work was focused on the unitary case. So some of the solutions we found were, in fact, missed because people were just imposing that uh, the central charge would be positive. And two short questions, please. Uh, you mentioned that in the Delaney theories, uh, you get null vectors when the uh, uh, inequality is saturated. These null vectors are in the product of two currents? Yes, those, that's exactly right. So these null vectors are in the product of two currents. Uh, well, some of them are in the product of two currents. Those are the ones that correspond to this Joseph uh, relation that defines the Higgs branch. Uh, there's also other relation that, uh, that you, you, will, you will see when uh, you take stress tensor and two currents or, and, but of course given that in this case uh, the, the, the stress tensor is Sugavala one, you can also interpret that as multilinear products of currents. Okay, one last. Yeah, so in usual 4D n equal to 2 SCFTs, if you know the dimension of the Coulomb branch and the 4D central charge C, you can calculate the A central charge from it. Uh, so is that relation still true for your theories or? Okay, so you're probably referring to this uh, conjectural uh, Chapelle Tachikawa sum rule, which says that two, uh, two A minus C is equal to one quarter sum over the generator of the Coulomb branch of two R minus one. Well, that relation is conjectural and um, I only used it uh, here to compute this last column. But in some sense, this is not really part of my story. So yes, if you just further assume that some rule I can predict, and I f further assume that the Coulomb branch be uh, of rank one, then I can f uh, further predict this number. And I find this funny number, five thirds and five half. Well, there is a, essentially a theorem that says that, uh, that he, there's no uh, special Kähler cone uh, with this uh, deficit angle. So I'm a little bit puzzled a little bit puzzled by the in meaning of these numbers. Okay, I think we should uh, stop here. Let's thank again uh, Leonardo. <laughs> now I call uh, upon the last speaker, Andre Enriquez, uh, from Oxford and Utrecht. <laughs>